Welcome to Mission Majima, Ajahn. Ajahn. So tell us about the Dhamma Dayada Sutta Majima Nikaya 3. The Dhamma Dayada Sutta is translated as heirs in Dhamma. And in this sutta, the Buddha encourages simplicity and he encourages seclusion. He starts off the whole sutta with the whole paragraph in different ways, saying, be my heirs in Dhamma, not my heirs in material things. And he's talking to monastics, specifically the commentary says, at a time when he had been teaching for some period of time and there had been material gains accruing to the Sangha. So tasty food and a lot of it, uh, nice huts, nice beautiful places to live and nice robes, etc. So this is the Buddha's way of encouraging. He couldn't say, just don't eat. You're not allowed to eat food. So this is just a, a reflection. Uh, it's not just a reflection, but it it is, the commentary actually calls it, it's like a full-length mirror placed at the gate of a city mm. uh, for monastics to reflect on their own manyness of wishes. The Buddha then goes on to describe a somewhat interesting, somewhat confounding uh, example. He says, suppose there were two monks who came to me and I've eaten my food and there's some left over and I would offer it to them. And the first monk doesn't eat, even though he's hungry and weak, and then yeah, practices. The second monk does eat the food and the Buddha actually praises the first monk. Then he leaves. Then he goes to his hut and Sariputta, this is our first meeting of him. He's the Buddha's right-hand monk, the foremost in wisdom. He comes and elaborates on that teaching, basically telling monastics, whether you've been ordained for a short period of time, a bit longer, or for quite some time, that you should train in seclusion like the Buddha. You should give up the things he said to abandon and you should be, uh, mindful of what your duties are as a monastic. Mm -hmm. And then he teaches the 16 upakilesas, or somewhat this broad spectrum of uh, defilements or mental hindrances, stains on the mind, and then gives the Noble Eightfold Path mm -hmm. as a solution for that. And this is our first encounter with uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. I'd be curious what you find uh, the sutta is trying to say, but first, what is the Eightfold Path, the factors of it? You have samaditi, right view, uh, samasankhapa, right intention, samavacha, right speech, sama uh, kamanta, right action, sama ajivo, uh, right livelihood, sama wayamo, right effort, sama sati, right mindfulness, and sama samadhi, right concentration. And we could go into each of those, but um, maybe it's more uh, prudent at the moment to say that those often get divided into a threefold division of sila, samadhi, panya, ethics, concentration, and wisdom. And sila uh, are the conduct by body and speech, um, right speech, right action, right livelihood. Uh, sama samadhi, or sorry, samadhi is the uh, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. And then the wisdom um, quality or qualities are at the beginning in right view and right intention. So, and as to what I find intriguing about this sutta, um, I think probably what a lot of people did when they initially began encountered it, which is this uh, sort of example of the monks. And I think we can really come to this and wonder why is the second monk not praiseworthy as well? I mean, the voodoo would go to waste. And I think in this context, it's useful to note first that the Buddha didn't dispraise um, the second monk who takes the food. He just praises the first more so, the one who doesn't take the food from him. But second, I think it's a useful primer in understanding that throughout all the suttas and the Majjhima Nikaya as well, so this is useful to see at the beginning, the Buddha was teaching in context of a profoundly integrated society. There's a quote uh, by Ajahn Chah where he says, you know, sometimes I see someone about to veer off the road to the left and they say, go right, go right. I see them about to veer off to the right and they say, go left, go left. And many of these suttas, because they were given by the Buddha in the context of a very caring, integrated culture, when brought into a very siloed, um, self-deprecating culture, such as many moderns have grown up in, can sound very stern. Um, so the Buddha was giving this teaching uh, to a particular time, to a particular sangha that was gaining an immense amount of wealth and I think this was a way of steering people towards simplicity. Um, and I don't think it is an admonition against ever, you know, accepting food that 
has uh, might go to waste otherwise. But it's worth noting also that one thing that could have been going on is the monks realizing that they might begin to look to the Buddha as a source of material wealth rather than Dhamma. And this is a real issue. Venerable Ananda, before he agreed to be the Buddha's attendant, had a condition that the Buddha would not pass on spare robes to him because he didn't want that perception from others that he was just serving the Buddha for that. So I think it's a very interesting sort of analogy, but can be used as that mirror, like you said, simple, clean, and uncompromising in a sense. Would you uh, talk a bit more about the five qualities of simplicity that you mentioned, Ajahn? Yeah, so this is in the context of that story of the the two monks, and the Buddha says that the monk who doesn't um, take the food goes on and cultivates these qualities, which I frame in my mind as being principles of radical simplicity. And I think that's important. And I think it's not necessarily the case that someone just by not eating is going to be cultivating these. So I think it's a specific Mm -hmm. instance, but the qualities are interesting in that they don't appear in many different places, but I do find their useful uh, guiding principles for life, not just for monastics who are Mm -hmm. trying to live a an ultralight, very simple existence of renunciation, but also for lay people who are trying to simplify their lives and uh, bring less clutter to mm. things. So the, f- the qualities are uh, fewness of wishes and contentment, mm. which the Buddha elsewhere called the highest wealth. You've got um, effacement, which is a way of undercutting pride and sense of self. And you've got being easy to support and arousing energy. So these are very much true in terms of looking at the things that we accumulate in our lives, but also in terms of what we accumulate onto the present moment, what we bring into the present moment. Can we give up having many wishes in the present moment, be more content, efface this constant self that's bubbling up, rising up, and yeah, be easy to support, have the the present moment be unburdened and Mm. yeah, arouse energy. So cool list. For you, anything that was intriguing? I think it's helpful to place the sutta in context of the ones that came before. You know, what the compilers of the canon, I think, were doing, or what you could see them doing, um, is with Majjhima Nikaya 1, they cut off all our proliferation and fixation on external phenomena. Um, That's the Buddha saying, all these 24 bases that we get stuck on are are just rooted in desire in the mind and heart. Then in Majjhima Nikaya 2, the Sabhasava Sutta, he gives us this vocabulary for ways of talking about how we work with uh, unwholesome states to make them wholesome. And he introduces us to the Four Noble Truths, the most core framework in in the Buddhist teaching. And then in Majjhima Nikaya 3, he gives us the Upakilesa, the 16 flavors of defilement. So And he introduces us to the Noble Eightfold Path, which he at later times compared to this ancient path to an ancient city that he discovered again, its core. So he's building, he's giving us a vocabulary to talk about the mind and the heart. It's brilliant. And that vocabulary becomes the the kind of dictionary we'll use for the rest of of this Nikaya. And speaking about those terms, Ajahn, the 16 Upakilesa, what would you say about them? Yeah, as you were saying, uh, the Buddha's building. So in the first sutta, we've got the Buddha talking about these three roots of the unwholesome, uh, passion, anger, and delusion. And these 16 really fit under those different umbrellas. So you've got greed, envy, avarice, conceit, arrogance, and vanity as different flavors of passion. You've got hate, anger, resentment, contempt. Insolence is different shades of hate and deceit, fraud, obstinacy, rivalry, and negligence as different types of of delusion. And uh, do we have a word of the day? The word of the day is Dhamma. So Dhamma here, it's used in two different ways in this this sutta, meaning the teachings. So we should be an heir to the Buddha's teachings and as things. Uh, Sorry, Buddha tells us we should abandon those things that the Buddha told us Mm -hmm. to abandon, but it also can mean mind states, it can mean nature, it can mean truth, and we'll see those contexts in later suttas. All right, everybody. Um, so we'll see you again in just a few minutes on Zoom and again next week for Majjhima Nikai number four. Thank you.